Robert, thank you for joining us in Waterstones Piccadilly. Such a pleasure. Um, we're here to talk about your new book, which I'm going to say, I'm going to say the title is WTF for, fe for fear of... It is, but that is the title. That is the title, WTF, as the kids would say. Um, this is a book obviously written in response to the things that have happened uh, recently. Uh, Brexit and Trump, I suppose, will be the, the main categories here. But before we get to sort of, you've got three questions on the front of the cover here yeah. that you pose. But before we get to those, I wondered if mm. I could ask you first about the, the first two words of the book, actually, which are, Dear Dad. Mm. Uh, this is sort of written almost as an, as an open letter to your father, who you lost in April of, of last year. Why did you choose to write the book in that way? And what, what is it about your relationship with your father? That So I had spent my entire life talking with my dad about politics, the way the world works, and some of the events since he died um, are just not what was supposed to happen. Yeah. You know, in the case of Brexit, um, my dad and I would always have said that British people um, would tend to vote in a way that was consistent with what was going to make them richer or poorer. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a pretty powerful argument that voting for Brexit makes people a bit poorer. Mm -hmm. Not devastatingly so, mm -hmm. but a bit. Um, and there are obviously plenty of other reasons why people might have voted for Brexit. Mm. My dad loved America, worked a bit of time there. Um, would never have expected Americans to elect such a capricious some would say dangerous president as, as Donald Trump. Mm. Uh, my dad actually was in the sort of centre-left of the Labour Party all mm. his life. Mm. Uh, he was a sort of tribal Labour person. Mm. He would never have expected Corbyn to be leader of the Labour Party or indeed come as close as Jeremy Corbyn has come to be being Prime Minister. Mm. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn may yet become Prime Minister. And so... There was a lot that happened in the world that he would not have expected. And so I thought that I would try and understand why voters have done these really quite bold and different things um, via a letter to him. Mm. Um, and you know the way I sum up these events and other phenomena in Europe, whether it's the election of Macron in France or the rise of the far right in Germany, and indeed the rise of what you either call populism or extremism all over rich countries. Um, you know, I would summarize all of that as effectively millions of people, particularly people on lower incomes, kicking the establishment, kicking the people who've run this place for decades, basically saying, look, the way that you have run our countries has been for your benefit, not for ours. And, and, and so, you know, this is a book that tries to explain why millions of people rightly feel that governments haven't been working for them, why they rightly feel that economies have not been managed in a way that benefits them. Mm. And then in explaining what's gone wrong, and I make no bones about it, a lot has gone wrong in our societies over the last few years. Mm. And then try and sort of come up with some ideas for how to put it right. You mentioned that your that your father would have been sort of confused, would have been surprised to see what had happened. And I think I think he would have been upset. I mean, I'm, I, I, you know, I guess I think a bit surprised. I mean, look, let's be clear. I was surprised, you know, um, shortly after midnight, uh, you know, on the night of the Brexit count, mm. um, because uh, you know I had assumed that the, 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 the Remain side, the side campaign to stay in the EU, would win. Not by much, but I thought they were going to win by a little bit. Mm. So I, you know, but after that, actually, I then did expect Trump to win because I could see what was happening in the states was, in some ways, the anger in the states was quite similar to the anger yeah. we'd seen here. So I did expect Trump to win. Um, was also clear to me in the course of the general election campaign that Corbyn was doing massively better than most 
people had either expected or, or indeed most of the establishment thought until result, the result was in. Mm. Um, so I, in a sense, I, I, you know, I was, you know, having been bitten as it were, I, I, I sort of began to get things a bit more right in terms of my own thinking and, 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 and predictions. But it has taken me, you know, quite a lot of, you know, re-examination of the things that I held to be true about how you manage economies um, to properly understand um, why there is this widespread anger among voters. Mm. You mentioned that it's the thing with the economy, you make two very good points in the book. One was to do with the, the policies of austerity uh, having a huge impact on, on Brexit and the other was trying to explode this myth about borrowing, about borrowing being a bad thing and, and public sector investment being a bad thing. Um, so, um, the, the reasons why um, so many voters are angry are, I mean, it, it is quite a complicated picture. Um, the unfairnesses um, are many and varied. And, you know, they range between the fact that older people have all the wealth and all the assets and younger people struggle to get even job security, let alone a foot on the housing ladder. Um, that there are huge regions of our country, of France, of America, uh, which are chronically depressed and much poorer than richer places like the metropolises, like London, mm. for, for example. There are huge gaps in the economic performance of different parts of the country. You, you know, places like London and the South East very productive, places like the North East, major problems in generating wealth. But then on top of that, as you say, there have been, I think, big mistakes in terms of the way we manage the economy. So one of the things that I think is odd, in a way looking back on it, is that Gordon Brown as Chancellor, who I think in many ways is an underrated politician these days, and mm. uh, you know, certainly an underrated Chancellor, um, did this thing which I now think um, looks very mistaken to me, which is he bought into the sort of right-wing view that deficits, government deficits, government borrowing is always a sort of bad thing. Yeah. Um, and in fact, for many years early in his time as Chancellor, he generated these surpluses. He actually paid down the national debt in a way that's incredibly unusual. I mean, mm. even Tory chancellors had largely failed to do that over many years. Mm. But the problem with having, with, with in a sense, ideologically buying into the idea that, you know, small borrowing is good, is that when the coalition comes in, in 2000, and rightly, let's be clear, rightly tries to shrink what is by that stage a very big deficit. And, you know, I, I, one has to be clear-headed about this. After the crash, because of the collapse of tax revenues and the increase in benefit payments to those who are on low incomes or unemployed, the deficit had in this country reached unsustainable levels. You can't, as a government, borrow essentially 10% of the value of everything you produce year after year and not eventually have a calamitous crisis because the people who lend to you will eventually stop lending to you and then you're bust. Right? So, you know, they had to do something about the deficit. But what I argue in the book is that they made a fetish of getting the deficit down that was excessive. And they did things which I think are, were not great. Um, they did things, for example, like cut very productive investment by the government as a short-term way of getting the deficit down. Now, you know, you, you, the, the, the reason I'd say that's a mistake is because investment tends to increase the growth potential of the economy. Um, when the growth potential of the economy is undermined, you actually get less tax revenues, and it's actually a self-defeating policy. Mm. Um, but the problem was the Labour government of the new Labour government uh, of the late 90s and the early 2000s, having basically bought into the idea that, you know, paying down the debt is a good thing, it then became much less, e basically became very hard 
for the um, opposition at that time, led by Ed Miliband, to make a convincing case against the government's economic policy, because broadly, um, the consensus and you know among voters, which had actually been reinforced by Labour, was that you know borrowing was intrinsically borrowing by the government was intrinsically a bad thing, mm. and that I think led to a longer period of austerity of, of public sector cuts than has actually been healthy. Mm. And that we're still in now, that we're still sort of... And, and we are still prisoners of this myth that, you know, f faster reductions in deficit and faster moves to curb the rise in the national debt are intrinsically a good thing, mm. despite the evidence that, you know, we have paid quite a big economic price because we've never, as an economy, recovered significantly mm. since the crash of 2008 and frankly we are still bumping along at a very low rate of growth and it's one of the reasons why so many people feel angry because not only is the rate of growth low but also the share of that growth that they're getting in terms of wage increases is mm. negligible.